Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Looking forward to this evening's presentation. We're excited to have uh, some welcome back, some friends from the Landscape of Change project. As many of you know or may remember, it was just about a year ago that we had uh, a special science cafe where we talked about this new project called Landscape of Change. And this is a really wonderful collaboration between a number of, of MDI organizations or local organizations, and it's really spearheaded by the Mount Desert Island Historical Society and the Scudic Institute. And they were kind enough to allow some of us to tag along. So folks here at the MDI Biological Lab, the College of the Atlantic, and of course, um, the a climate to thrive and the national park so it's been a really fun way to sort of take a look at some historical data and try to find some uh, present day application for that information and what we're here tonight is to share with you some of the results from about a year's worth of work on this project and we're super excited to have rainy bench who's the executive director of the mdi historical society with us along with katherine schmidt who is the science communication specialist at the scudic institute and they are joined by joanna blackman who is from a climate to thrive so welcome everyone we're really excited to have you with us this afternoon and looking forward to hearing a great update on this project and about uh, sort of where to go from here. So Rainey, I'm going to just quickly turn things over to you. And again, welcome, everyone. Thank you, Jerry. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thanks so much to the MDI Biological Laboratory for hosting us again on the Science Cafe. It's such a great opportunity for us to share this really unique partnership. And as Jerry mentioned, uh, many of you, I think, were probably with us just over a year ago when we announced this new collaboration that we called Landscape of Change. If you were not here for April's uh, of 2021's um, announcement and, and that opportunity to meet, we have it on the Mount Desert Island Historical Society's webpage. You can go and click and download and be able to view that video. And I know the MDI Biological Laboratory also has it on their YouTube channel. So I would encourage you to go back if you wanted to learn sort of the impetus and how this whole project came to be. Tonight, we're really excited that just over a year later, we have some really concrete evidence to be able to share with you and some new findings, and also to talk more about the importance of using that information as an advocacy tool to be able to promote preservation and conservation of our natural spaces, and also uh, mitigation and resiliency strategies in the face of climate change. So, um, so we're sort of bringing this whole picture uh, around full circle. So as we mentioned, Landscape of Change is this incredible collaboration using historic records to document and pull observations that uh, took place over sometimes well over 100 years ago or even longer that were um, observed by um, students, farmers, ice harvesting collectors, you know, whomever was sort of out there recording different things um, that are held in the collections of historical societies like the Mount Desert Island Historical Society. Um, and, and we can get that information and create longer data sets that scientists can then use to be able to look for trends and changes that have taken over uh, place over time. So to really understand what's happening in the world around us today on Mount Desert Island, we have to understand what the ecosystem was like in the past through those observations collected in historic records. By understanding what's changed and what's around us currently, we're then better able to predict what changes we can anticipate in the future, but also be able to create strategy, strategies for protecting and advocating for those things that we need to be able to, um, to, to uh, really be able to have a sense for how we wanna um, plan for the future and, and protect our environment. So landscape of change really asks the following questions. What is changing? So what around us is changing? Why are those things changing? And what can be done about it? And so what you'll see tonight is a little bit of that um, conversation that we've been engaging with and the answers that we have. So the first year that this was built, you can see here on the slides, um, we really started to work with information collected through a series of logbooks that are held in the collections of the Mount Desert Island Historical Society. 
These logbooks were written by members of the Champlain Society. This group of students visiting from Harvard every summer between 1880 and 1893 kept really meticulous records on the various things that they were seeing around them. Biological uh, reports, they had botany, birds, um, they had uh, observations about climate, they had observations about sea levels and seawater temperature and all sorts of different things that um, were sort of being able to um, share the environment around them. But it was so important to be able to take that information from our collections and be able to give access to it to as many people as possible. So digitizing that information, being able to transcribe it and create um, avenues for scientists, especially to have access to it, but, but just for the general public, really allowed the scudic scientists especially to get into the data and create comparisons. The first step that we needed to do for landscape of change was take all this information out of these logbooks and put it onto a map. So Catherine's going to talk a little bit about that process when she goes into her, her um, portion of the conversation this evening. But by being able to map the different things that were being observed in the 1880s and 1890s, we were able to create a baseline from which we could start to measure change over time. And then we had a great opportunity last summer after all of this information was compiled to really start working with community scientists. So through Acadia National Park and Scudic Institute, they created a series of programs and bio blitzes where they invited people to go out onto the landscape, especially at the historic sites where the Champlain Society and other scientists and observers in the past were making observations. And so then we can have a direct comparison to the observations that were made in the 1880s to what is being observed on the landscape today. And so over the course of this last winter, the scientists at the Scudic Institute have taken those two um, periods of time and they've been able to analyze that, comparing those records from the past and finding, um, analyzing them and finding the results that we're gonna be looking at uh, together this evening. And so the idea for this came from these logbooks because the Historical Society believes that history matters. We believe that the decisions that were made in the past impact our lives today, and they're able to inform how we make decisions about our future. And being able to partner with these different organizations empowers us to take those voices, use them today to inform the future. And so if you want to learn more about the Champlain Society specifically and the work that they have done, you can look to publications that, um, first of all, they're all available through the Mount Desert Island Historical Society's website. But in addition, last year, our annual journal called Chibaco was published with Catherine Schmidt as the editor. And we have annotated versions of the first three years of the Champlain Society logbooks. And so you can get a sense for where they were and what they were doing and the type of data that they were collecting. But this is not the end of the Historical Society's work with landscape of change or using our historic records to continue to engage people in these conversations. It is so important, especially related to climate change, which can feel like such an overwhelming and sort of distant experience that we don't necessarily know how to get involved with, for us to find various points of entry for the general public. Maybe science is not the way that they're gonna be able to engage with this information, but the historical society are interpreters. And so we can find exhibitions and public programs and different points of engagement. And it was through that, that we were inspired to work with artist Jennifer Steen Boer, who has um, for years done the photography for Chibaco. And for the edition of the 2022 uh, Chibaco journal, it's about imagining the future. So it's pretty hard to sort of take photographs to imagine what the future might look like. And so we asked Jen if she would be interested in creating a series of images about what we risk losing if we don't take action related to climate change and make changes. And so you'll see down on the bottom um, right hand side of this slide, one of Jen's original artworks uh, talking about the alewife die off that took place in Somesville last spring. 
This series is called We Change With Them. And not only is it featured in our edition of Chewbacca, but thanks to the Maine Humanities Council, we received a grant to create a museum without walls. And we're taking Jen's artwork out onto the landscape at various points throughout the summer, where we have scientists like Catherine or um, scientists at the biological laboratory who are gonna be available to answer questions about the research that goes into um, climate change and climate science. But in addition to that, we're using Jen's artwork as an entry point for an emotional connection to what's changing. So later we'll announce a few of those dates for upcoming events. And now I'm really excited to turn it over to Katherine Schmidt to dig into the analysis and the results of this last year of study. Thank you so much, Rainey. Um, thanks everyone for being here today. I am gonna turn off my video while I speak just to save bandwidth because I'm running the slides today um, from my home office. Um, I do want to acknowledge my colleagues at Scudic Institute who contributed to the work I'm going to share with you today. Um, Kyle Lima, Seth Benz, and Peter Nelson. Um, and Seth and Kyle are um, with us this evening. And so hopefully if you have technical questions about the data or the analyses, um, they, they will be able to um, to answer them, as well as any specific bird species you might be interested in. So the Champlain Society's logbooks and reports, as well as data collected by 20th century naturalists and scientists and volunteers, are this baseline that we can now use to understand how this landscape is changing. And I'd like to know what, if in the chat, what changes have you noticed or experienced? We're all have been living with climate change long enough now to have all witnessed or experienced or noticed or felt changes in the landscape. And so I'm really interested if you could just put in the chat the changes that you have seen or are seeing and just keep that running um, dialogue going throughout this talk um, because we've all we can all sort of contribute and it's a it's we're all part of this conversation it's not there's not enough scientists we can't just leave it to the scientists so please share that um, and I'm I'm anxious to see what you've noticed or experienced. We worked as part of Landscape of Change, um, and these figures are in that story map, um, but we're, we're revisiting them now just to bring everybody um, some common ground about um, the changes in the climate. And we worked with Sean Burkle, who's the Maine State Climatologist at the University of Maine, to try to get as close as we could to some Acadia and Mount Desert Island specific trend data. And so when he looked at, so in the upper left is a chart of the average annual temperature in Bar Harbor, which is the top brown or orange line, and in the coastal climate division of the state of Maine, which just basically runs along the coast of Maine. And the Bar Harbor data is, is spotty, um, so there's gaps in it. And so he felt, so the coastal climate um, gives us a little bit more reliable trend data. And so the, the trend is the same in terms of the rate and the um, degree of increase, which is about three, average annual temperature is 3.4 degrees warmer um, since record keeping began in the 1890s. And so Bar Harbor, Mount Desert Island is seeing a similar change, but it's actually even a little bit warmer. And so the same holds for precipitation. Again, the local record has some gaps in it, um, but if we map that against the coastal climate division record, um, we can see that it um, aligns fairly closely, but is, is wetter. So if precipitation has increased, if average annual precipitation has increased six inches along the coast, um, it's even a little bit more in Bar Harbor. And then the sea level, this is from the tide gauge in Bar Harbor, Bar Harbor at the town pier, um, and sea level has increased eight inches. And ocean temperature is on average four. This is sea, sea surface temperature is four degrees warmer. And I think one of the key things, right? This is what we've all seen this. We're all experiencing this. 
Um, we've all seen the effects of it. Um, but one thing to note is that the rates are increasing. So the slope of those lines um, keeps changing and gets steeper and steeper with every year. Um, and so the rates of change are really not anything that, um, that sort of recent humans have, have experienced. For landscape of change, we chose to focus on birds and pollinating insects, um, in part because these groups had really good historic records. And they're also a focus of, con you know, of concern for people now. Um, and ecologists today, there's a lot of studies around the world on insects and on birds. And so these were the ones that we decided to focus on. We also, there's an overwhelming amount of information on the historical Mount Desert Island environment. And so we also had to kind of constrain ourselves at least in year one. And just to review, um, so for some of you, this will be a reminder from last year when we launched the project, um, and it might be new for others, um, just a little bit about these historical data sets that we were using. So the bird data um, were represented by the Champlain Society's Ornithology Department, which was led by Henry Spellman and included uh, Charles Townsend, Julius Wakefield, and Robert Worthington. They went out and collected birds every year and compiled um, their master list of birds of Mount Desert um, into this manuscript, which there's a copy in Acadia National Park archives. So we had a list um, from them of 98 species, and it is important to note that they were active primarily in the summer months from June through September. Roland Baxter led the collection of butterflies and moths for the Champlain Society. Um, some of his specimens, so um, the, some of the birds are in the collection of the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology, and then some of Roland Thaxter's insects as well, but not quite as many. Um, just one of note is this um, little yellow butterfly, which we can correlate their, their specimens, their notes of what they were seeing um, with data and descriptions from the log books. And so we have sort of these multiple sources of information that we're able to sort of cross check all of the historical records. In terms of insects, a much more comprehensive survey of Mount Desert Island insects was coordinated by William Proctor, um, at one time associated with the Mount Desert Island Biological Laboratory. Um, in the first half of the 20th century, there were other people who were contributing specimens, um, which is in the thousands. So there are thousands of preserved insect specimens that are in Acadia National Park archives, and their records have been digitized thanks to Glenn Middlehauser and the Maine Natural History Observatory. So important to note that we can't do this work um, without other people helping to do the kind of transcription and digitizing that we've done with the Champlain Society records. We pulled together these data sets and as Rainey mentioned in her introduction with the help of College of the Atlantic student Jasper White and Geographic Information Systems Laboratory Coordinator Gordon Longsworth, we created um, latitude and longitude coordinates for all the places where these specimens were found and so that they could create these layers of the map. And this is the map that we launched last year and sort of launched our citizen science effort to encourage people to go and repeat some of these locations um, and areas that were being surveyed. So this is that call for volunteers. We use applications called iNaturalist which is you post a photo of something you're seeing and either you identify it or other people can identify it. Um, and we also use eBird. We hosted several bio blitzes in the park in 2021. So these are events where groups of people go out and document species together. Um, through a series of social media posts and web articles, we shared stories of historical science and what people were finding and, and what people were posting to iNaturalist and eBird. So for the season, um, which we were calling our new season of science and wonder, there were more than 4,000 observations 
of 669 species of birds, butterflies, moths, and bees on Mount Desert Island posted to iNaturalist by 640 people. And that's summarized um, on this slide. The most commonly observed species were herring gull, monarch butterfly, double-crested cormorant, common eider, and common eastern bumblebee. In eBird, 1,206 observers made 87,973 observations of 243 species. The most observed species were herring gull, American crow, black cap chickadee, and song sparrow. We were then able to use these citizen science platforms to analyze changes in island bird and insect life over the last 150 years. So the general message for anyone who needs to leave early is that biodiversity in terms of the number of different species has increased. So there are more new species that have appeared on Mount Desert Island since the early 20th century than there are species that are no longer here. Again, this is of birds, butterflies, bees, and moths only, um, but abundance, so the total number of plants and animals is down. If we look at insects, bees, butterflies, and moths, then and now, Proctor, in his very comprehensive and intensive you know, couple of decade long effort to survey the insect fauna of Mount Desert Island. He collected 1,360 and 1,360 species. While the iNaturalist community over the last 10 years, so we had to extend our analysis to more years um, in iNaturalist um, to get a better snapshot for what's on the island now. Um, so in the last 10 years, there's been 362 species. So if we look at the overlap between those two data sets, um, the iNaturalist community, so today there's about, they found about 20% of Proctor species. So 274 insects shared on iNaturalist were also found by Proctor in the 1900s. So this means there were 88 species identified today that were not recorded by Proctor's efforts. Um, and so they're likely not present. So with the insects, just because they didn't find it now doesn't mean it's not here. Again, because of the difference in effort between the two um, data collection methods. But if it's found now and Proctor didn't find it, we can be pretty confident in saying it's new to the island. So the iNaturalist observers, you know, observe dramatically fewer species than Proctor. And again, this is due to sort of the difference in methods. Um, <clears throat> so some of them, so we can look at these new arrivals to maybe get a better sense for what do they say about how the landscape is changing. And then that might give us information about the insects that we're not finding. This, it, this figure shows the species diversity of, of insect families of what was fine historically and modern day. And I will say, so these, the figures and the tables, I'm gonna put a link to the chat. We have a final report that is out and available. Um, and so I'll put that in the chat at the end that people can have a PDF and you can really spend some time and um, dig into this data um, at your leisure. So don't worry about capturing this now because it's all um, in the final report. We did have a little bit more rigorous data on bumblebees. And so we um, looked at those um, and they're also a really important group of pollinating insects. Uh, Proctor recorded 10 species and today we had nine species documented, but there's only six species in common. So in this table, um, is showing which species have sort of disappeared from the Mount Desert Island environment, which ones are new since the 20th century, and then which ones um, have been present consistently. So future research, one of the things that um, is in the report is a lot of recommendations for future work um, and, and what, what are some of the next steps based on this um, initial analysis. 
And so we do think there's additional data sets that could be incorporated. And that includes some bio blitzes that happened in partnership with Acadia National Park beginning in 2004. And so adding these data will provide us with a much more complete snapshot of what species are currently present on the island and how we can make management recommendations to help the insects of our region. Um, we're also planning to connect, there's currently a statewide effort being coordinated by Maine Audubon to look at statewide insect trends. And so now that we um, have these data, proctors data in a good um, format and they've been edited, we'll be able to share them with that effort um, and learn, learn even more from these data beyond Mount Desert Island. Okay, how about birds? When we examine the changes in relative abundance of historically observed bird species, remember there were 98 species that the Champlain Society documented, we found that 8% of these species increased in relative abundance, 14% decreased, and most, so 76% exhibited no change. So in this chart, which is showing the number of species that decreased, increased, and there were no change between the 1880s and today. Um, we could only, so when we looked at, so the Champlain Society in their list, they described a bird as common or rare. And when we analyzed eBird data, again, over, a, we used a five-year period of eBird observations, we had to, turn those observations into ratings of common or uncommon. And then we only, so if we're saying that a species increased or decreased, it's only if it changed two steps. So if something was, went from uncommon to common, we're not gonna say that that increased in frequency, but if something went from rare to common, then we would say that it increased. So. So we sort of built in a little bit of cushion in this evaluation. And so in the report are lists of species um, and then indicating whether or not it has decreased or increased in relative abundance. So some examples of the 8% of historical species that have increased. So what birds are, are there more around now than there were when Henry Spellman was out with his gun? One of those is the black-throated blue warbler. Um, another is the blue jay and the eastern phoebe. So black-throated blue warbler um, was very rare in the 1880s and is common today. Um, and it was probably rare because 1880s was not far away from the peak of land clearing on Mount Desert Island. And so there, there's a lot more forest, which is where black-throated blue warbler lives today than there was in the 1880s. Examples of the historical species that have decreased. Um, so more species have decreased than increased, but most species have not changed in terms of relative abundance. So the ones that have decreased include American woodcock, black crowned night heron, and yellow bellied flycatcher. This map shows black crowned night heron distribution across Mount Desert Island today. Um, <clears throat> and black crowned night heron uh, lives in wetlands, and so loss of wetland habitat could be um, one possibility for the decline. Um, our analysis really was comparative, and so um, explanations for the causes of increases or decreases or no change are so part of some of our next steps. So today we also have a lot of species, 82 in total, that were not recorded by the Champlain Society, but are regularly documented by observers today, including the house sparrow um, and other species that were introduced by humans um, since the 1880s, such as the European starling and the rock pigeon. So we're continuing work on the birds, including closer study of changes in bird distribution across Mount Desert Island, studying the effects of changes in habitat versus climate, and incorporating additional data sets into analysis. Um, and one example, so Scudic Institute has had a parallel effort to look at Christmas bird count data. So this is early winter um, bird counts um, with a little bit more, um, a little bit stronger data than just presence absence. 
And so we have 53 years of Christmas bird count data from both Mount Desert Island and Skudik Point. And both of those data sets show a 50% decline in abundance. That's the total number of birds. And so that's work um, that's in preparation right now at Skudik Institute. So bringing in some of these other data sets, the Breeding Bird Atlas is another one, um, is gonna help us, I think, answer some of the questions that you probably have about the reasons for these declines or these increases. And there's a lot of work still to do on plants and birds and insects, um, as well as other areas. If we just look at the Champlain Society data, we know their geology department led by Professor William Morris Davis has all kinds of notes on the shoreline of Mount Desert Island. And so this can give us um, a record of, of what sea level changes might have been like and what the effects of sea level rise might be. Um, there's also Champlain Society surveys of marine invertebrates and of fish species on the island. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunity there. Here's the marine biology records, which we are working with the Mount Desert Island Biological Laboratory um, for a project called Intertidal Synthesis to try to, which we've built a database of a lot of these records, but it awaits analysis. So I'm gonna turn it over quickly to Johanna Blackman, who's gonna help, help you make sense of, of what to do with all of this information. And I'll um, put, a, put the link in the chat to the final report. Thanks, Catherine, and thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm Johanna Blackman, and I'm the executive director and a founding member for Climate to Thrive. And I don't know if I'm going to necessarily make sense of exactly what to do with these incredible findings in this highly useful tool, but I did want to share a little bit about how I look at it as someone um, involved in grassroots and community-driven climate action. So we can go to the next slide, Catherine. Thanks. So it's been so wonderful to participate in this program, and we're really grateful to the Mount Desert Island Historical Society for inviting us to be part of this. And I am extremely excited about this report um, and about the place that a report like this and a project like this can hold in inspiring individuals and groups to get involved in addressing climate change. Um, and so came up with this kind of image here to think about what could be elements of the most significant um, contributions from a project like this. And so I loved what Rainey said at the beginning about how Mount Desert Island Historical Society holds history and the importance of history. And I think a project like this really solidifies the, signif the significance of history um, and shows the way in which history informs our present and our future um, and how records that were kept in the past can be really important for understanding what is happening today and what might happen tomorrow. And when I think about this contribution and, and apply it to um, participation in addressing climate change, I think the really important thing that it contributes is an expanded understanding of time and our impact. And this is something that's so important when we think about understanding climate change and being motivated to participate in solutions is that we need a really different understanding of time. We need to understand our connection to the past. We need to understand how the past has informed the present. And we need to understand that the things that we do today and the choices that we make will have very long-term impact. And so I think that a project like this really brings home that kind of expanded understanding of time and how it can apply to understanding and working on climate change and inspiring others to do so. I really appreciate how this project import, illuminates the importance of collaboration, um, both in how it has taken place with so many different organizations participating, but also in how the records were established in the first place and how the citizen science is unfolding today and you know, illuminating the importance of collaboration in addressing climate change and also that there is a role for each of us to, to play, um, that, that addressing climate change is not just something for politicians or for scientists, which I think is you know, a perception that many of us can have that can kind of stop us from getting involved, but that there's, there's something we can each play from within our existing lives, that there's a, there's a role and a contribution that we can make. And, and it might be that of observing changes in our, in our um, landscape around us and reporting on those. And that, that is a really important contribution. And it, of course, the really you know, key piece that this contributes is it's data with emotional context. And so we're all here because we care about 
the ecological systems here on MDI um, and in this in the surrounding areas and that we have a tie to this and we're seeing changes and that concerns us because we have this emotional tie to this place. And so that is, of course, a really powerful motivator when we consider, um, you know, climate change and and why we might be concerned about it and why we might want to do something to address it um, and to to address the changes that we're seeing. And it strengthens the sense of immediacy because I think that there can often be this misperception that climate change is in the future, um, and or it is something that is happening to communities far away from us here. And so this report, you know, and, and many others like it can show that this is something that is immediate in, in multiple ways. And um, we can go to the final slide, Catherine, that I have. Thank you. So when I think about all of this, and this is something I've, I've spoken with Rainey and with Catherine a bit about, what comes home for me is an expanded understanding of stewardship and what it means to steward a place that we feel really connected to. Um, and so, you know, this is stewardship that that is informed by a sense of urgency, um, along with that steadfast love of place, because we know from very sound scientific reports that we have very little time to dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions if we're going to um, successfully address climate change. We can't turn back the clock. There's a lot of changes that have already been built in, but we can, um, you know, address what will happen in the future. And so there's a sense of urgency in stewardship today um, that is really important to acknowledge and, and to act on. Um, and this invites us to consider um, what might be an expanded list of stewardship activities. Um, so those that are involved in Re quickly reducing reducing greenhouse gas emissions to address climate change it might not be a way that we thought about um, stewardship or preservation of place in the past, but clearly needs to be a very key element of how we're thinking about stewardship today. And I think that you know, as we think about species and the changes that we're seeing in species locally, it really drives home this fact that climate change is not going to impact all of us equally. Um, and so there are human communities that are at particularly high risk, and then there are a lot of other species that are at particularly high risk. And so there's an invitation to act now um, for those at highest risk to try to reduce how far um, temperatures rise. And I think the final point that I really wanted to um, illuminate here that, that comes to me hearing this report and from this project is that whatever you care about, it connects to climate change. And so that's something that I always really like to, to highlight when talking to folks about climate change that, you know, I think that the best thing we can do is talk about climate change more and talk about it from this lens of, of connecting with each other about what we care about. And for many of us, it is a sense of place um, and, and that that is kind of the thing that the thread that really draws us in to recognizing that we want to get involved um, and that we want to be stewards of the future today. And I'm going to um, end there, but I'm going to drop a link into the chat of a display um, that was part of Axe Community Climate Solutions Fair this past weekend that looked at mapping your own participation in climate solutions um, and has some stories of some, some people locally who have really found a way to participate in solutions from within their existing lives and bringing their existing strengths and skill sets which is always the best way to go. You don't have to change who you are. Um, we're all needed as we are. And just to mention that three of the four towns on MDI are currently doing climate action planning focused on resilience and mitigation. Um, and that another great way to get involved is to be on the outlook for ways to support those climate action plans. And of course, we always welcome participation at A Climate to Thrive. So again, thank you for having me. And I'll drop that link into the chat. Thank you so much. Um, so we are all invited today to be stewards of the future, and this is just the beginning. Um, so the report is called Year One. This presentation is called an update because our work continues and there's a lot of opportunities, which um, to end, we're just going to share a bunch of upcoming events and opportunities um, that you can get engaged in. Um, and one is, I, I hope that this report and this effort shows the power and the meaning of participatory science um, and that we really do use data that are shared on iNaturalist and eBird, as do scientists all around the world. 
Um, so we can't do it all and we need everyone's help. So we are asking people to continue to post observations as well as sounds that are heard of birds, insects, and other life to eBird and iNaturalist. You can document arrivals. So this is the season. There's still a lot of new things blooming and new birds arriving and butterflies arriving every day. Um, there's opportunities to revisit the historic survey hotspots or repeat surveys on specific dates. And you can also help from home. So you can help us locate, digitize, and transcribe historic data sources. Uh, we, Scootic Institute, is hosting, if you're, if you're interested in iNaturalist and doing some of this work, um, but would like to do it in a group with some training, we have an event on June 18th at Scudic Point, birds, bugs, birches, and barnacles, and you can share and do a bio blitz with us and learn how to use the iNaturalist platform. And Rainy uh, mentioned this event. Um, Rainy, do you just want to share a little bit about what's happening on June 23rd? Yeah, so I mentioned that we have a museum without walls that we're bringing to various locations throughout the island to engage with people on the issues of climate change out in the landscape where it's happening, where we're seeing things start to change through artwork created by Jennifer Steen Boer. So we will be at the Somesville Museum campus on June 23rd from four to six. And Billy Halperin is gonna be there from the Soames Mayal watershed system talking about the alewife die-off that took place last summer and putting that into context and then talking about the overall health of the watershed in the village of Soamsville. And then we'll have a series of events coming throughout the summer, including at the MDI Biological Laboratory in July, um, where we're working with scientists and the artwork to be able to engage and communicate with people. And then the Mount Desert Island Biological Laboratory has Family Science Night on July 6th. Jerry, do you want to share anything about this event? <laughs> sure. I would just say this is a great um, family event. So we open up our entire campus and essentially have sort of an outdoor science fair, if you will. We task all of our students who are with us on fellowship in the summer to come up with a creative activity or display that helps convey uh, the projects that they are working on in, in the lab with us this year. So we typically have between 12 and 15 uh, hands-on activities for people of all ages. We tend to, to um, <laughs> make them available to kids, say from age five to 12, but we actually have more adults participate sometimes than we do kids. So if you're interested, please um, come by. It's a wonderful, wonderful event. And this year, we're really excited to sort of open it up and have collaborators from other um, science entities around the state. So we're going to, I hope, have um, some folks from Scudic Institute join us this year, as well as folks from the Maine Discovery Museum and other places. So um, you can sign up online on our website and register. We do ask that folks register in advance just to help us plan a little bit and um, come enjoy the fun. So I just say we have some questions that are um, coming up in the chat and while Catherine wraps up, um, if you, I just wanna encourage people, if you have any additional questions, feel free to add them to the chat and then um, I will help moderate that um, once Catherine's finished with her presentation. I am finished um, with a whole bunch of thank yous to all the people who have made this project possible to date. Um, really appreciate everyone's help and really looking forward to even more of you joining us in the coming year. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I can go back to some figures if people need me to, um, but um, everything's also in the report that I linked to, but I'm going to stop sharing so that we can see each other. Yeah, and just as people start populating the chat, uh, I just want to also mention Catherine said and Johanna as well that this is not the end of this project for us. This is in fact just among the very beginnings of some of the things that we want to do together. We want to continue to dig into this information and study specific resources to understand uh, what historic resources are available in not only the Mount Desert Island Historical Society's collections or Acadia National Parks collections, but our history partners in other organizations on the island as well. We want to be able to link that and create longer data sets to current science being done. And so in partnership with SCUDIC, 
Uh, we're creating these research groups that include historians, scientists, students, and volunteers to be able to dig in over the course of the next few years and really create uh, much more uh, detailed looks at these different um, impacts that are taking place around us. So really exciting work coming up ahead for us. Um, and so in the chats, I've just had questions. Uh, first of all, how is it determined that a species changes? Is this graphically depicted over time and what statistics were used? Or yes. sorry, graphically displayed over time and what statistics were used? Yeah, so I'm actually, Kyle Lima is on with us. So I'm gonna ask him to um, join the conversation and answer that question because he can answer it a lot better than I can. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Kyle. I'm Scudic Institute's data analyst. And the answer to your question is that it was not necessarily a typical statistical analysis in the sense that the data did not allow for that. And what I mean by that is that the 1880s data was very observational. Uh, unlike modern eBird data, it's not point locations all around MDI. It was just kind of a list of species and then notes on how common to uncommon these species were. So to be able to compare that, um, it doesn't really, in the typical numerical sense, you know, running a statistical analysis, you can't do that. So that's why we lumped it under these categories um, that, we re that we call relative abundance. And so we can compare the relative abundances and then we distinguish change based on that change of more than one category of relative abundance, as Catherine had mentioned earlier. And I just want to pop in here and um, just mention that how appreciative I am of the scientists who have been involved in this project with us. Because when I asked the question, if these historic observations had any value to scientists today, the fact that their creative way of looking at data and thinking about the information from the past and how it could be applied to understanding the landscape around us today is, um, is, is unusual. And so the fact that we are not dismissing historic material and observations simply because it doesn't meet the modern scientific rigor, I think is a model that is really important for other collaborations like this one to be inspired to use and to think about the ways that we can recognize and understand exactly what Kyle said. We're not going to get necessarily all of that information, and so we're going to have to make compromises. But ultimately, what we are finding is useful and helpful and relevant and real. And I'm really grateful for our science partners for being able to think creatively about how we work with this information. Uh, so next question, we've seen a significant temperature increase in the temperature of our cove in the last 20 years. Did the Champlain Society measure water temperature? Not ocean water temperature. So they did some hydrology in the lakes, um, but again, not, they did like depth soundings um, and there are certainly notes on the shoreline, but not water temperature. Where are you seeing black-throated blues? <laughs> uh, so I mentioned in the chat one spot uh, that I saw them yesterday. So uh, the Acadia Birding Festival just occurred over the last weekend. Um, and I'm one of the guides, as uh, Seth Benz is as well. And we were both participating. And I led a group out at Blagden Preserve on the western part of the island and had a black-throated blue over there. But they're they're becoming more common and um, as we showed and they're in a lot of locations across the island. Thank you. So Seth Benz, one of the um, research scientists that Catherine mentioned in the study, who's uh, also leading the bird group, which is our, our first focus group that we're, we're working that I mentioned as a sort of our next step, uh, commented in the chat that since 2016, we've received nearly 110,000 observations via iNaturalist in Washington and Hancock counties. These are all taxa observations. So this is um, really, really helpful contributions that people are making. So Seth, thank you for those numbers because that is really impressive. 
And then we had another question. Are we experiencing a Vero invasion? They seem to be everywhere. You can't see them easily, but Merlin Sound ID picks them up all the time. Is this unusual? I'm gonna let Kyle or Seth answer that one. Although I will say, I have been see seeing a lot of them last year and it feels like, like last year they were everywhere and it, I'm hearing them this year as well. <laughs> I don't know if Seth is, wants to talk. <laughs> I'll give it a shot. Okay. Um, uh, we're finding that with Merlin, it, it's picking up um, sometimes on the same bird, it's reporting both Philadelphia Vireo and red-eyed Vireo. Philadelphia Vireo is, is much rarer in our neck of the woods. And so we urge all Merlin users to be careful uh, when you see that happening. Um, you, you really need to visually verify Philadelphia Vireos anywhere that they're reported, especially in Acadia National Park. It's not a bird that we see very often. And also the frequency at which red-eyed vireos uh, vocalize, and I suspect, suspect Philadelphia vireos vocalize, um, is easily picked up from distance by Merlin. So that may account for what seems like a, a vireo invasion. Um, thus far, we can't really say that there's, you know, more than any other year um, at this stage uh, of, the, of the spring. And now we're settling into um, breeding season. So we'll just have to watch for that. But, but thank you for that question. That's a, an astute observation for sure. So I, I would just, oh, sorry, Kyle, go ahead. I was just gonna add, uh, our, if, if you read the report that Catherine put in the chat, it does show data for the both more common species, the blue-headed and red-eyed vireo. And both used to be common historically and still are uh, common today. So their relative frequencies have not changed over the, the time span. So this has been, I think, a really great plug for the importance of citizen science. We can see how the Champlain Society logbooks 140 years ago, their citizen science observations are really transformative for our understanding of what's happening to our landscape today. But we also have a lot more records in the collections of historic organizations. So as we're putting a call out for involvement, here's another thing that Catherine mentioned in her list of things that you could do is we would love for people to help with transcription. The Champlain Society logbooks are only just transcribed thanks to a volunteer named Maureen Fournier who went through and did all of that work. And so anyone who's interested, this is great winter work. Um, a lot of these things are digitized already. So you would be um, having opportunities to get involved and in sharing out um, some of the information that we're looking for now is going to be harder to glean out of historic records because the Champlain logbooks are a rarity in their focus and in their consistency and in their availability. Thanks very much to the family who kept them, preserved them, and donated them to us. But we have a lot of other wealth of information in letters and diaries and journals. That's a little bit more of a goose hunt. But um, if anyone is interested in reading historic documents, um, please don't hesitate to get in touch. That's great. Rainy, I'm just going to jump in and also say, you know, certainly this project is a phenomenal way for folks to kind of get their feet wet with citizen science, but there are a ton of other ways folks can participate as well. And so I would say if anyone's interested in that, um, you can do, you know, certainly a Google search, but I know like, for example, here at the MDI BioLab, and I know also at Scudic, there are a lot of other projects. So, you know, even if maybe hiking or, or birding isn't what really excites you. There are things as, as mundane as testing your own tap water to get a sense of um, arsenic levels and, and things like that. So if you have curiosity or a desire to participate, that's something that we would love to explore with you as, as all of us as a group. So let us know. All right. And uh, that seems to be the last of our questions. I really am grateful again to the BioLab for helping to bring us together through these science cafe opportunities and to Scudic Institute and A Climate to Thrive 
for presenting both the findings from this last year of work, but also hopefully some information, uh, inspiration on how we can continue to work together moving forward to um, use historic records, understand the present and advocate for a, a stronger future together as an MDI wide community. And I'm grateful for all of you for spending this gorgeous evening with us. And uh, hopefully you'll be able to dig into the report from Scudic Institute and um, find different ways to get more involved. That's great. Rainey, thanks to you and, and to Catherine and to Joanna for being with us this evening. It's such an exciting thing. You know, a year ago, this was just a beautiful idea. And so it's so much fun to see that there's actual data. And we really look forward to next year uh, getting back together and, and hearing another update on all the great work that this project has really facilitated. So thank you for all your hard work and coordinating. And, um, you know, it's it's been a, a huge lift, but we're really thankful to all of you, to all three of you for, for um, all that you've done and for being here and sharing those results with us. It's wonderful. Just a quick plug for our next Science Cafe. We're going to switch and go into the uh, world of microscopy. So here at MDIBL, we're excited. Um, We've had some, some new grants that have allowed us to purchase very sophisticated microscopes where you can actually image live organisms to see what's happening in these um, animals in real time. So pretty exciting, especially for us if you're interested in regeneration and regrowing limbs and damaged tissues because we can watch that process in real time. So join us um, on June 13th for a conversation with our microscopy experts. And we're gonna show you some fascinating images and beautiful photography, if nothing else. And um, But as always, really, really appreciate everyone's participation in our science cafes, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks very much. Thank you, guys.